This morning, I want to welcome back any college students who maybe had a nice long break. We want to thank you uh, for coming, and we hope that you're blessed today. One announcement, at the end of the service, we'll be having our choir practice like normal, and uh, Deb has said, if anyone's interested in joining choir, young or old, uh, male or female, any range of voice, they're looking especially for altos, but anyone is welcome to come. It's a good time to join choir. It's the beginning of a new uh, cycle, and so if you're interested at all in singing, if that's a gift and an interest, Please feel welcome to come to the front of church following the service for practice. Uh, with that announcement, what I'd like to do to begin today is I'd like us to begin quietly. I know we all have very busy lives, many of us, uh, busy weeks. So I'd like to begin today by asking us to open in prayer of silence. And then that silent prayer is going to go right into listening to a song, which is a prayer for God to gather us in. And so with our hearts, let's join in that song as we open the service in prayer. Let's pray in silence. as God has gathered us in and believing that none of us are here by accident, please stand for God's call to worship. And this morning it comes to us from the prophet Micah. Micah chapter 2. God says to His people, I will surely gather all of you. I will surely bring together the remnant of Israel. I will bring them together like sheep in a pen, like a flock in its pasture. The place will throng with people. One who breaks open the way will go out before them. They will break through the gate and they will go out. Their king will pass through before them. The Lord at their head. An image that God gathers us as his flock and as our king, he leads us forth. We open the service singing together. Psalm 428, O worship the king.
believe God is our King who gathers us, we also believe that He is our friend. And as our friend and our Savior, He greets us this morning. Friends, grace, mercy, and peace be to you. From God the Father, His Son Jesus, our Savior, through the power and the working of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As God's people gathered, would you please give a warm greeting to everyone around you, especially any visiting with us today. may be seated. Each week as a church we gather in confession to lay our lives honestly before God. Often and appropriately those confessions are as personal as each one of us because we each bring our own sin into this place. But at times it's good to confess corporately sins that we share with our nation, with our culture, with our world. Sometimes we do that confessing the sins of injustice and the poverty that binds people around this world and in our nation. This morning with other churches, we are commemorating the sanctity of human life. and We are confessing our corporate sin of allowing in this nation death to come to the weakest and most vulnerable among us, unborn children. And as a call to confess that, we are reminded through the words of a contemporary testimony, our will belongs to God. I'd like to, to invite me to join in reading this litany. Life is a gift from God's hand, who created all things. Receiving this gift thankfully, with reverence for the Creator, we protest and resist all that harms, abuses, or diminishes the gift of life, whether by abortion, pollution, gluttony, addiction, or foolish risk. Because it is a sacred trust, we treat all life with awe and respect, especially when it is most vulnerable, whether growing in the womb, touched by disability or disease, or drawing a last breath. When forced to make decisions at life's raw edges, we seek wisdom in community, guided by God's Word and Spirit. Would you pray with me? Gracious Father, we confess this morning that you are the God of all life. Heavenly Father, we look at our nation and at this world and we see how far we are from who you are and how you've called us to live. So Heavenly Father, we ask that you would teach us to respect and to love all all the lives that you create. Heavenly Father, we ask that you will forgive us for our lack of concern and lack of love for those who are yet unborn. Forgive us for growing comfortable with the daily injustice Lord, forgive us for these 53 million creatures that you have made in your image that we have killed before they were born. Heavenly Father, we come to you as broken people. For some of us, this is a personal confession. Heavenly Father, we bring to you the depth of our own sin, our selfishness, our pride. We pray also that you would forgive us for the way we've looked past the value and the sanctity of all human life those who are bound by disability, those who are bound by old age, people that our culture tends to march right past. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would open our eyes to see the miracle and the beauty of every life that you create. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would forgive us our sin and that you would free us from the binds of sin or that you would enable us as a people to pursue justice and righteousness and holiness. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, we bring our confession personally and corporately, and we hear God speak to us a word of assurance from Psalm 103. God says, The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will He harbor His anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve, or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. 
As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him, for he knows how we are formed. The Lord forms us in the womb. He is our Father. We respond to this word of grace, singing Psalter Hymnal 589, our Father whose creative love. responded to God's forgiveness, asking that he would give us wisdom to nurture and to grow his body from youth to adulthood. One of the ways we do that at Bethel is through care and concern groups, which are small groups of brothers and sisters in Christ that make up this bigger body of Christ. And those are led by an elder and a deacon and also by what we call a care and concern group coordinator who helps to shepherd that group. Now as a church, we last Sunday installed new elders and deacons. This morning, we are going to commission those who serve as care and concern group coordinators, even as we commission our Sunday school teachers and those who go out on projects. We do this recognizing that the church belongs to God and that those who serve in God's church need His Spirit to empower them. So I'd like to ask all who are going to serve as care and concern group coordinators this year to please stand where you are. Sisters in Christ, the celebration of baptism, we pledge ourselves to nurture one another in faith, in hope and in love, so that we may grow as living disciples of Jesus Christ. Some serve as teachers, some as ordained office bearers, and you will serve as care and concern group coordinators. You have been selected to provide under the elders and deacons pastoral care to God's people. You are charged to represent the gospel of Christ with gentleness and insight as the Spirit guides you in words and in witness. And so now I ask you, do you promise by the grace of God to give yourselves to this calling with diligence, energy, and love, and to be guided by God's Word and Spirit? Friends, what is your answer? We do God helping us. Congregation, I'd like to invite you to stand as well. As a body, we receive the gift that God gives us of those who serve. So I ask us Christian friends to acknowledge the gifts and calling of our care and concern group coordinators. And I ask us, do we receive these women as servants of Christ, pledging to support them in their service, encouraging them with work and prayer, and considering ourselves co-workers with them in the service of Christ and His kingdom? Congregation, what is our answer? We do God helping us. You may be seated except for the coordinators. I'm just going to give you a brief charge. Servants of Christ, this is your charge. Accept the service with which you are entrusted. Do not neglect the faith that is in you. Present yourselves to God as approved workers, ever faithful to His call. Share with God's people who are in need. Share God's love, His care, and His compassion. Remembering always that Jesus called you as friends and as servants. And apart from him, we can do nothing. Thank you. Even as we've commissioned now these sisters to service, we commission ourselves as a body to serve one another, singing together, make me a servant.
invite you to turn with me in God's word as we prepare to hear him speak to us. We are in the book of Esther in the Old Testament, beginning chapter 2 this morning, and that is on page 460. If you have a pew Bible available, please find it and use it, page 460, Esther chapter 2. If you don't have a Bible available, the words will also be on our screens. Yesterday, my wife, along with others of you, went to see a, a, a play in Sioux Falls. When she came back last night, she gave me some words of advice from that play. Uh, one of the characters said that her father had always taught her that what a good sermon is. A good sermon, he said, is like a woman's skirt. It is long enough to cover the subject, but short enough to keep men's attention. And so she was hoping that I would have a good skirt today, and we're going to do our best to, to do that. Some of you I know are back after a break, and you're not sure where we are in Scripture. We are, this is our third sermon of nine in the book of Esther. We began this study of the book realizing that of all the 66 books of God's Word, Esther is unique. In the first seven centuries of the Christian church, there were no commentaries written on the book of Esther. In the Reformation, the great reformer Martin Luther said that he wished Esther had never been written. John Calvin, who wrote extensively on the entire scripture, never wrote a single sermon or commentary on Esther. The reason for this neglect is because Esther and all the scripture is unique in that it does not mention a single miracle or a character who prays or any mention of the law of God and obedience to that law. And in fact, in the entire ten chapters of Esther, there is not one mention of God. And yet we saw at the beginning of this series that behind the silence of God, Esther is a sustained reflection on one question, and that is how do believers live in an unbelieving world, especially one in which God doesn't seem to be present? That's the question of this book. The very first sermon then we saw that this unbelieving world is the world in which Esther lived. The very first uh, verse, verse of Esther says that this was the time when Xerxes ruled. Xerxes, as we saw, was a man who fashioned himself to be the king of kings, who at the beginning of chapter 1 throws a 180 day feast, culminating in a a seven day banquet, all to proclaim his glory. And we saw as we looked at his celebration, which was a preparation to invade Greece, that behind the pomp and the circumstance, we learned a lesson about the plans of mice and men. That in Daniel 11, 100 years before Xerxes was born, God said that he would invade Greece. Xerxes' plans were submitted to God's sovereignty. We also know from history that his plans to invade Greece were disastrously ruined. He was stopped by 300 Spartans at the Battle of Thermopylae. Then he was stopped in the battle of Salamis and then Plataea. He came back defeated and we saw that his human plans don't have the weight of God's plan. That was the introduction to this book. Who is the real king of kings? Last week Sunday we looked at Vashti, his wife, and we saw in the conflict between Vashti and Xerxes a deeper conflict between men and women that's rooted in the curse after the fall. And we saw how Jesus is the answer to that battle of the sexes. Now we move into chapter 2, and I ask you to pray with me as we do so. Heavenly Father, once again we come to these ancient words. These words that you have given, that you have preserved through centuries and the rise and fall of empires. Heavenly Father, we thank you that also by the freshness of your Spirit in our midst today, we can hear these ancient words as your living word. Heavenly Father, use them to stir in us a hunger to know you, Heavenly Father, show us also the profoundness of your grace as you use people like us to build and to serve in your kingdom. Father, we pray that you would do these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to read the first 18 verses of Esther chapter 2. Later, when the anger of King Xerxes had subsided, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what had been decreed about her. Then the king's personal attendants proposed, Let a search be made for beautiful young virgins for the king. Let the king appoint commissioners in every province of his realm to bring all these beautiful girls into the harem at the citadel of Susa. Let them be placed under the care of Haggai, the king's eunuch, who is in charge of the women. Let beauty treatments be given to them. Then let the girl who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. This advice appealed to the king, and he followed it. Now there was in the citadel of Susa a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin, named Mordecai, son of Jer, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, 
who had been carried into exile from Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, among those taken captive with Jehoiakim, king of Judah. Mordecai had a cousin named Hadassah, whom he had brought up because she had neither father nor mother. This girl, who was known as Esther, was lovely in form and features, and Mordecai had taken her as his own daughter when her father and mother died. When the king's order and edict had been proclaimed, many girls were brought to the citadel of Susa and put under the care of Haggai. Esther also was taken to the king's palace and entrusted to Haggai, who had charge of the harem. The girl pleased him and won his favor. Immediately he provided her with beauty treatments and special food. He assigned to her seven maids selected from the king's palace and moved her and her maids into the best place in the harem. Esther had not revealed her nationality and family background because Mordecai had forbidden her to do so. Every day he walked back and forth near the courtyard of the harem to find out how Esther was and what was happening to her. Before the girl's turn came to go to King Xerxes, she had to complete 12 months of beauty treatments prescribed for the women, six months with oil of myrrh and six with perfumes and cosmetics. And this is how she would go to the king. Anything she wanted was given her to take with her from the harem to the king's palace. In the evening, she would go in there and in the morning return to another part of the harem, to the care of Shazgaz, the king's eunuch who was in charge of the concubines. She would not return to the king unless he was pleased with her and summoned her by name. When the turn came for Esther, the girl Mordecai had adopted, the daughter of his uncle Abihail, to go to the king, she asked for nothing other than what Haggai, the king's eunuch, eunuch who was in charge of the harem, suggested. And Esther won the favor of everyone who saw her. She was taken to King Xerxes in the royal residence in the tenth month, the month of Tabeth, in the seventh year of his reign. Now the king was attracted to Esther more than any of the other women, and she won his favor and approval more than any of the other virgins. So he set a royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. And the king gave a great banquet, Esther's banquet, for all his nobles and officials. He proclaimed a holiday throughout the provinces and distributed gifts with royal liberality. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Brothers and sisters, I said last week that my job as pastor is not just to help us see what Scripture teaches, but more deeply to see how we read this book. And last week I suggested that there are two common but unhelpful ways that we often approach Scripture, and I was going to deal with one last week and one this week. Last week I showed the unhelpful way that we often approach Scripture is what I call the exemplary method following Karen Job's. The exemplary method of Scripture says that the point of this book, especially its stories, is to give us examples, and some of these examples are positive and we're to emulate those examples, and some are negative and we're to avoid living like them. But we saw last week as we tried to apply that to the character of Vashti, that that reading of Scripture as a group of examples isn't helpful. For a lot of reasons, but one of them is we don't know really who's a good and who's a bad example so often. Vashti, for example, we saw in the history of Jewish and Christian tradition was often seen as negative. Most commentators, when they wrote about this book, saw Vashti as a rebellious woman who was not submissive to her husband, who was impudent, and that is someone, Martin Luther said, who didn't do her conjugal duty, and women shouldn't be like Vashti. But then we saw more recently people like Harriet Beecher Stowe and Elizabeth uh, Cady Stanton and Abraham Kuyper and also modern feminists, they say, no, actually Vashti is the one, unlike Esther, who stands up to patriarchy. She is an example of a woman of moral rectitude, of modesty and of virtue, and we need to be like her. And so we saw that an exemplary reading of Scripture is not helpful because it says more about us than about the Bible. We saw rather than looking for our example in the characters of Scripture, our example is the God who gives us Scripture shown in Jesus Christ. But now we move to the second way that's often we read Scripture that's not helpful. And I'm going to call that the religious reading of Scripture. A religious reading of Scripture looks at the Bible and at the world around us as if it's two different categories of people. There are good people and there are bad people. And they are completely different. And God loves good people and he doesn't love bad people. And God blesses good people, and he doesn't bless bad people, and God uses 
good people and he doesn't use bad people. So be a good person. And if God's used you, it must mean you're good. And if you're not being used, you must not be good enough. That's a religious approach to life and there are some of us who approach Scripture in this religious way. My goal for this morning is after we finish chapter 2, we'll see that not only is Scripture much more complex than this simplified religious reading, it's also a lot better news. Because maybe God isn't bound to only work with and love and bless the good. So with that before us, we jump into chapter 2. And as we do, we get a little sense of its setting, which is different than chapter 1. Chapter 2 begins with the words, later when Xerxes' anger had subsided. Now this later, we're we're given the timeline. Chapter 1 occurred, if you remember, in verse 3 of chapter 1, and the third year of Xerxes' reign, that'd be in 483. Chapter 2 finishes with Esther coming on the 10th month, which would be January, so this month, of the seventh year of his reign, so four years later. Now that's interesting to know that four years have passed, but it's even more interesting if you know history because those four years were not boring. Those were the four years that Xerxes took the largest army and navy ever assembled in the ancient world, had invaded Greece, was stopped by the 300 Spartans at Thermopylae, defeated the Battle of Salmis, and then finally defeated by the plains of Plataea. So in this interim period, this god king who had these great plans was showing his glory has now been defeated and has retreated in shame and humiliation. When we meet him in chapter 2, then, he is humbled. He is broken. He's a man who is lonely and licking his wounds. Those around him see this, and so they have a proposal to cheer him up. So we read in verse 2 that his personal attendants proposed. Now I want us to notice, because you might skip over this, in chapter 1, those officials who gave him his suggestion to divorce his wife, those people were described in the Hebrew as the sarim, the officials. That's a certain group of advisors. But the people who give the advice in chapter 2 are not that same group. These are not the seasoned officials who stand around the king. These are the naharim, which is usually translated not personal attendants, but young men. Xerxes has sunk so low, he doesn't ask his officials He asked his frat buddies what he should do. Now, when's the last time a young man has ever given really good advice, right? Young men are the kind of people who say, I think we can make the jump. Oh, there's probably no cops around this time of night anyways. How flammable can it be? Right? I mean, that's what young men do. And the young men, they have a proposal. And what's their great idea? Well, what young men might be thought to do. Their big idea is, hey, let's search for beautiful young virgins. Just like a frat boy what they decide the king should do. Four words there. We want to find women, but they're not just any women. They should be young. They should be sexually available, and they should be really good looking. And we want to gather those people for you. And if they're not quite good enough, we have an even addition to our plan. Let's give them beauty treatments, which we're told in verse 12 were extensive. That these beautiful young virgins were gathered from all over the realm. They were brought into the palace. And then we're told in verse 12 that for six months... They were given treatment with the oil of myrrh. That literally means they were rubbed with oil for six months. They're in a spa for six months. And then the next six months, they're given perfumes and cosmetics. And this is sparing no expense. This isn't like cheap cologne at the dollar store, you know. This isn't like Maybelline and Revlon that you get at Walmart. This is like Clinique. I mean, they get the good stuff. Because we want these women to look their best, to smell their best, to be their best, because they're coming to the king. So at the beginning of chapter 2, what we get is this image of a Persian, like a Miss Persia contest, like a beauty pageant. But maybe a better example would be like a Persian version of The Bachelor. Anyone ever watch that show? If anyone nodded their head, pray for them. The show where you have one man and lots of women and they compete for his affection and all the drama of that, that's what's going on here. And of course, unlike Chris Harrison coming out and saying, now this is the final rose, Xerxes gets to keep the whole bouquet. And so he hears this plan, and we read in verse 4, not surprisingly, the plan appealed to the king, and he followed it. Yes, it appealed to him. This is the understatement of Scripture. All the beautiful women of the world get to have all kinds of beauty treatments for a year. They get to come to you, and you get to have your way with all of them. It's good to be king, says Xerxes. Do it. I want us to think about this plan. It's possible that some of us, especially young men, might think this sounds like a kind of a fun thing. 
And it's even possible that some young women might think this was kind of a fairy tale story. I mean, Xerxes, according to the ancient historians, was tall, dark, and handsome. He was one of the better looking of the ancient kings. He also was the most powerful man in the world and the most wealthy. He was the most eligible bachelor, probably in his low 30s. And so it's possible for us to view this story as the story of this great mighty king who gives all the maidens of the country a chance to become queen, a chance to become wealthy and to live in the palace. And this is wonderful. But that's not at all what's going on. As this edict is executed, we see what this actually looked like. We read that there were many women who were brought to the citadel. Now these many, according to the historian Josephus, there was, he said there were 400. We know from other Persian records that Artaxerxes II, he had 360 concubines, one to have every night of the year. Other scholars have said if Xerxes got one girl per night over a four-year period, like were, were suggested, that means he had 1,460 women. This is not something to make you feel special. This is using and abusing women like disposable items. This is not glamorous. And if you look at this from the perspective of those women, we didn't know if they were asked to, to come. We didn't know how many of them had boyfriends or fiancés, how many of them had dreams for their own lives, how many of them loved their families and didn't want to be uprooted and taken to the capital city, but they weren't asked. If you look at it, there are many women and they are brought to the citadel of Susa. They are compelled, gathered like cattle. And then when they are brought there, they're given these beauty treatments for a year, but they are on trial. And their trial comes down to one night. We read in verse 14 that in the evening they will go there. This is not dinner and a movie and romantic candles. You just come when it's dark, you take off your clothes, you do your thing, and you better be out in the morning before the sun rises and I wake up, and don't text me or call me, I'll call you. Xerxes is one of those men who treats women like property. He loves beautiful things, gold couches and floors inlaid with jewels and big draperies, and for him, women are nothing else than a beautiful thing. They are living dolls that he can trot out and play with and discard. We want to talk about sex objects that are these women. And after their one night with the king, they are cursed to perpetual widowhood. No other husband, no other chance of intimacy, no children, unless they're lucky enough to have gotten pregnant that one night. This is what Xerxes does to women. And if you think it's hard to be a woman in the empire, it was even harder to be a man. Because you notice in this text, there's also things done to men. We read in verse... Um, Three, there's this eunuch named Haggai. And we read in a, later on, there's another eunuch named Shazgas, which was a hard enough name to live with, but now he's a eunuch. In chapter one, we also saw that there were these seven eunuchs who went as messengers. In fact, if you read history, the Persian court loved eunuchs. Every year they collected tribute from all the vast realm, which is often gold and silver, but it also included boys that they would mutilate. Every year, Babylon alone had to send 500 young boys to be castrated. Ethiopia had to send a certain number. Each kingdom, there are actually records of how many boys they had to give. If women had their sexuality abused through one night of forcibly being taken, these boys had their sexuality devastated in an even more profound way. But that's the way the empire works. The empire says to anyone who was in its power, we own you. We own your body, we own your sexuality, you are nothing to us but an object, you are a thing, and we can use and abuse for our pleasure, and you don't matter. That is what this empire is like. A world in which people in power use their sexuality only for themselves, in which everyone else is just for their pleasure and is disposable. That's the world in which Esther found herself. The question is, how do you live in a world that bent, that broken, that distorted in its view of sexuality and humanity? Well, as we ask that question, the text actually gives us two people who had to do that. This is when we finally get to meet the good guys in the story. And who are they? Well, we meet the first of those in, in verse 5, Mordecai. He's a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin. Now, the verse goes on to describe who he is and who his descendants were his ancestors, and we see that the defining characteristic of Mordecai is that he is an exile. Four times in Hebrew we see that. This is a literal translation. His ancestors 
had been exiled from Jerusalem with the exiles who had been exiled with Jehoiakim, whom Nebuchadnezzar had exiled. That is who he is. He is an exile. But of course, an exile isn't a neutral term. Mordecai's people were exiled because they were sinners. 2 Chronicles 36 says this. These Israelites mocked God's messengers. They despised his words. They scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord was aroused against his people and he carried them into exile. We meet Mordecai and he is defined as the child of wicked people. People who were so bad that God had to cast them out of the land and send them far away to punish them. That's who Mordecai's lineage is. And that's not just his history, that's his biography. Because you notice in Chronicles 36, it says, they'll be exiled to Babylon until the kingdom of Persia comes. God prophesied that when Persia come, they'd be able to go back, and they were able to. The first king of Persia, Cyrus the Great, his very first year, said anyone can go back to their homeland. He even funded the Jews to go back to Jerusalem. That was in 538 B.C. This is the seventh year of Xerxes. That is 479 slash 78. That was 60 years later. What is Mordecai doing in exile still? Why hasn't he gone back to the promised land where God called his people to live? Why hasn't he gone back to Jerusalem where he can worship Yahweh? What is he doing in exile? He is not one of the pious Jews who returns to follow the law. He is one of the power-hungry ones who not only were taken to exile in Babylon, he has now left Babylon to go where the real power is. He is living in the citadel of Susa. Now that's an interesting tidbit we're given. There's a city of Susa. Archaeologists have found the citadel was 70 foot higher. That's where the palace was. He's not just a resident of the city, the capital city. He works for the government. He's in the palace. He has compromised his religious heritage so he could be where all the action is. That's Mordecai. And how about this other character we're introduced to? His cousin. Well, her name is Hadassah, who is also known as Esther. Scholars say the fact that she's given two names is telling. Mordecai is from the Persian word Marduka, which means worshiper of Marduk. Again, showing that he's compromised. Hadassah is Hebrew. It means myrtle, which is a sign of peace. But she goes by Esther, which is a Persian word for the goddess Ishtar, the goddess of love and war. She's got a foot in one world, her Jewish identity, and a foot in her Persian world. She's trying to straddle. She's trying to play the game. That's Esther. And they live in this broken sexual world of Persia. So the question is, if you were them, how would you have lived in that world? I want to ask you men. Imagine you were Mordecai. Imagine you were charged with caring for some young teenage girl. You are her protector and her guardian. She's an orphan. She is, only has you as her family. And there's this edict proclaimed by these young men that all the beautiful virgins are going to be taken and they're going to be used sexually by an uncircumcised pagan. Fathers, how would you respond to that? How would you respond? Would you fight? Would you take your daughter and hide her? Maybe be like the parents of Moses, who when another powerful emperor, Pharaoh, said you had to kill their children, they hid him in a basket in the Nile. Would you hide her? That's not what Mordecai does. In verse 10, he does the opposite. Rather than hiding her from the empire, he tells her to hide her faith. Don't let anyone know that you're a Jew. Don't live like one. Don't speak like one. Don't worship like one. Don't eat like one. You just become purely Persian. That's not what righteous people do. A Jewish commentator from the 15th century said this, Now then, when Mordecai heard the king's herald announcing that whoever had a daughter should bring her to the king, why did he not risk his life to take her to some deserted place to hide? Why did Mordecai not keep righteous Esther from idol worship? Why was he not more careful? Where was his righteousness? And that's a question. This is a compromised empire but Mordecai is a compromised person. Okay, women, how about you? If you were Esther, a foot in both worlds, living in an empire which likes to distort your sexuality, which tells you that your value is putting out for men, how would you respond? 
Would you have responded like Daniel and his three friends and not eaten the choice food? Esther eats it. Would you have responded like Joseph, also in a foreign court with foreign powers, who flees from the sexual advances of Potiphar? It's not what Esther does. In fact, she so pleases this man sexually that he makes her queen. Esther is not all that we might think of her either. With Mark Driscoll, I think as we look at this story, there are three possibilities as we try to understand Esther, especially in light of a religious reading of Scripture. The first of those possibilities as we read this story of this compromised kingdom and compromised believers is we could say that's not right, that actually Esther is consistently good. That Esther is one of those virtuous women who is courageous and moral and modest from the beginning of the story until the end. She never changes because she never needs to. We could read this story as if Esther is a saint. How many of you have ever seen the movie One Night with a King? How about the movie that came out last year called The Book of Esther? Anyone? No one? I watched both of these in preparation for this sermon. And you say my job isn't hard. <laughs> these are two renderings of Christians of this book. And it's interesting for me watching how Christians present the scriptures. Because the way we have to do it is we have to sanitize Esther. In both of these stories, she is completely godly. She leads Bible studies in the harem. In fact, in the, the most recent movie, it's God who speaks in an audible voice to her, telling her she has to go to the palace, so she's not compromising at all. She's just being obedient. And then when she has her one night with the king in the, in the one night with the king movie, they just have a kind of a book study, you know, kind of read some books together, and she tells them the stories of the Old Testament. And in this other one also, they just kind of hold hands, and the king says, oh, it's going to be so hard to wait to our wedding night. Friends, if you gather 400 to 1,000 virgins, you're not interested in practicing abstinence. Sorry. But we have to have Esther be so pure and so holy right from the get-go that she even purifies Xerxes. In our accounts of them, Xerxes is a fine and outstanding modern man who believes in the rights of women and waiting till marriage because that's the only kind of person who would qualify for how good Esther is. But that's not the Esther we meet in Scripture. Imagine if it was. Imagine if you wanted to take an exemplary approach to Esther chapter 2. What would our message to girls be? This is what it would be. Okay, the sermon, young girls, what I want you to do is I want you to make yourself as beautiful as possible to powerful men. Young women, I want you to use your body to advance the kingdom. And remember, everyone, especially young people, the ends justify the means. If you have to sleep with your professor to get an A to get into grad school, who knows, for such a time as this, you might need to be there. So just go away and do it. Right? Is that what we want our young people to behave like? Is Esther a role model here? I want to suggest that unlike Daniel, who didn't compromise his diet, unlike Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, who would not bow to the empire and were thrown into the fiery furnace, unlike Joseph, who fled from sexual immorality, at the beginning of the story, Esther is not so bold or so brave. She is not living for Yahweh. She is compromised, just like the world in which she lives. That's possibility number one. Second possibility is that maybe we shouldn't see her so much as compromised. We should see her as a victim of sexual assault. I want to be serious with this option. When we look at this story and we see all the power on Xerxes' side, we shouldn't be too quick to condemn Esther either. I can't imagine what it would be like to stand as a woman before the most powerful man in the empire. To stand as an exile, as a marginalized person in front of all the gates of the splendor with the guards of Xerxes standing just outside the door, to stand naked before Xerxes. There was such a power and balance there that how could Esther have done any different? So especially as we look at this text, we see twice we're told that Esther was taken to the palace. She was taken to the residence. This is an image of being coerced. One in three women in our world and one in six men know this experience. And we want to be careful not to sh heap shame on those who had their sexuality abused by another. And that could be Esther's story. Although I want to suggest that's not the likely scenario. I think it's not likely because the Bible knows how to present when abuse happens. 
In Genesis 34 with a woman named Dinah and 2 Samuel 16 with a woman named Tamar, there are examples of rape and the Bible is very clear about that. That's not the way this story is told. In fact, even though there's a lot of passive language in chapter 2, when it comes to her one night with the king, what we're told is active. Esther won this favor more than any of the other virgins. This doesn't seem like a woman who is actively resisting. So what's the third option if it's not that she's good and it's not that she's only a victim? The third option, which I would say is the most likely, is that Esther is a complex moral character. That she's not static. That how we find her in chapter 2 is not the way that she'll be at the end of the book, but there's growth that needs to happen. That Esther is a compromised person living in a compromised world. That she is a young woman who does not stand up for her faith, who politely hides it, who puts out to get ahead in life. That she is a person who is not the hero of the story, but someone who needs saving herself. And that's why this story of Esther is good news. That's why this religious reading of Scripture doesn't work. The reason our movies and the reason we want to make Esther to be good is because we know the end of the story, that she's used by God. And for religious readers, if you're used by God, that must mean you're good. If he loves you, it must mean you're good. If he blesses you, you must be good. She was used, so she must be good. But that's not how Scripture works. Scripture is not the story, not from Genesis to Revelation, of a God who uses good people. It's a story of bad people who need a God to save them. That is Scripture. A God who loves and uses and blesses even the broken. The story of Esther is not of a woman who is good, but of a God who is. At the end of the story, yes, she becomes queen. Yes, she's exalted. Yes, there's this feast declared. But it's not the story because Esther was faithful. It's because God is faithful. It's not a story that Esther had a great plan. It's that God had a great plan. A plan that can use even broken individuals in a broken world. God worked through the sin of Xerxes who declared a party to show his glory. God worked through Vashti who rebelled and did not obey her husband's command. God worked through the twisted advice of the advisors last week to divorce Vashti. God worked through the even more twisted advice of the young men to say have a beauty contest. God worked through the compromise of Mordecai who told Esther to hide her identity. God worked through Esther's one night with the king. Through a chain of broken humanity, God brings a beautiful ark to redemption. Where at the end of chapter 2, this orphan of a marginalized people is now sitting on the throne as queen. Not because she is good, but because God is good. Because God can work his perfect will through imperfect people. And that's the good news. What that means for us, brothers and sisters, is that none of us have screwed up our life so much that God can't fix us. None of us live in such a messed up world that God can't clean it up. None of us find ourselves in a world so bent that God cannot straighten it out again. It is Sanctity of Human Life Month. In this month, we recognize the compromises of our culture. Where since 73, 53 million children have been killed in their own mother's wombs. That every day, 3,315 new babies forming in the womb of their mother are terminated. This is a world that cheapens sexuality, that makes humanity into objects that you can discard, that treats human life as a temporary thing, that all that matters is your own pleasure and convenience. This is our world, and we are people who live in it. But this story says that God's not done with us either. That no matter what sins or mistakes we've made in our past, God is still going to work His grace in us and through us. I want to picture that in a closing story. Esther here is not the beauty with the beast. She, we see, is her own broken Smudged beauty. But this past fall, there was another beauty contest in our world. The University of Auburn every year has a Miss Homecoming Queen beauty contest. And this is the 100th year of it. So, of course, lots of Auburn women wanted to compete. You know, they were pretty good in football this past fall. So, you know, everyone wanted to be Homecoming Queen. One of the young women who competed for that is a young woman named Molly Anna. 
Molly Anna shared her story as part of this. Her story began before she was born when her mother was 22 years old and living in California. Her mother was sexually assaulted and through that assault became pregnant. This woman was also married and her husband was repulsed by this and he said she either aborts that baby or he will divorce her. Complex, what's the right answer? This mother found a Christian adoption agency who supported her and prayed with her and loved her giving her the strength to, even as her husband walked away, bring this baby to term and give her up to adoption. And now from the mess of that kind of a world, 22 years later, this woman's daughter, Molly Anna, was able to stand in front of a public campus and proclaim what God had done through her life to call women, no matter how broken their sexuality, no matter how broken this world, to not give up on the life within their womb, to realize the beauty from ashes that God can bring in our world. She won Miss Homecoming 2013. But the real beauty of the story is, of course, a God who doesn't give up on our world and who doesn't give up on broken people. That, friends, is the story of Esther. And through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that is our story too. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we confess that so often we look at the good in our life and we contribute it to our own goodness, our own fidelity, our own righteousness. Heavenly Father, we thank you that the story of Scripture reminds us that we are not the heroes of the story. Heavenly Father, that only you are through Jesus. Heavenly Father, we pray that each of us would be able to be honest with the sin and the brokenness in our culture, in our nation, in this world. And also in our honesty to see that you are a God of great grace who loves and who blesses and who uses the broken, who cleans us up through the blood of Jesus Christ and sends us forth to build your kingdom. Heavenly Father, because of this, all glory is yours alone. We offer it now in Jesus' name and all God's people say, Amen. We stand as the music begins. Our song of response is God and God alone a song that speaks of, as broken people, the fact that the glory goes to God who is the real hero of our stories, that not the best or worst of man can change our Father's plan. Let's stand to sing.
seated. We come to our God alone in prayer. A couple of announcements. One, just a reminder that tomorrow night at 6.30 is a training for Cornerstone Prison Ministry if you're interested at all in working with prisoners behind the bars, correcting uh, Bible studies and being a part of their life through that. There's a training tomorrow at 6.30. We want to pray for that ministry this morning. Also, we'll be praying for Junior Doima this morning. He has been diagnosed with stomach cancer, a fairly advanced, a, a good portion of his stomach now has cancer. He'll be going this Tuesday to the Mayo Clinic for a second opinion, exploring if there's any treatment options, but we want to pray for Junior Doima and his family. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we thank you for the wildness of Scripture and the wildness of your grace. Heavenly Father, that you are a God who stoops down and finds in the broken and the dead of humanity not good people who are worthy of salvation, but dead people that you in unimaginable grace make alive again. And so we can sing about your amazing grace that saves a wretch like me. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God who doesn't give up on this world. That even as we look at our culture and our nation, even this morning as we lament the sacrifice of human lives, the sacrifice of unborn children, even as we lament the ways in which we cheapen the lives of women and men, how we distort our sexuality, how we distort the image that you have made us to reflect to one another, we thank you that you are a God who is still not done. That the best and worst of man cannot alter your plan, that you are working through a chain of events, even through the sin of this world, to bring about its redemption in Jesus. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would form us to be a people who through your Spirit do not live lives of compromise. Lord, enable us to see what your grace does, not just cleansing us from our sin, but freeing us from the power of sin. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the church around this world, this one body of Christ which together gives the gift of accountability, which together gathers around your word each week, which together sings your praise. Heavenly Father, as a community, we thank you with our sister congregation, Bridge of Hope. We pray that you will bless that ministry even as you use them to reach so many on the margins, so many whose lives, life stories are filled with pain and brokenness. Lord, we pray that you will bless them. Bless Pastor Boone, give him wisdom, grant the leadership of Bridge of Hope Unity. Heavenly Father, we thank you for each church in this community. We thank you that we can pray for one another in this year. Gracious God, as a congregation, we also thank you for those that you call to shepherd and to serve in your name. We thank you for our elders and our deacons that we newly installed last week and this Sunday. We thank you for those who have served this past year. As Care and Concern Group coordinators, Lord, we thank you for their selflessness, for the gentle words that you have spoken through them, for the acts of kindness that you have shown through their hands. Heavenly Father, as we have now commissioned others to take up this role, some to continue in this role, we pray that you will bless them too. Give them the strength that they need, encouragement each day. May they know that they are your tools. Heavenly Father, we do lift up our missionaries who bring this message of grace to a broken world. We pray with Josh and Joni as they continue to work in Nicaragua. We thank you for that update from them. We pray that in this new year, you would show them new ways to love you and to call others to know you. Heavenly Father, we pray these things in a world that also needs you to work through the governments and nations of this world. We do pray for peace to continue to work in Egypt. You'd restrain violence in that country and in Syria. Heavenly Father, we pray that you will continue to Restrained forces of evil which would seek to get footholds in Iraq and in Afghanistan. Heavenly Father, we pray that your peace would surround us. You would keep those safe who are serving abroad. Or that those this day who cry out to you for help would find that you are their rock and their refuge. Heavenly Father, as a congregation, we are thankful with Grace Haverhalls for your measure of healing that she was able to return home. We do ask that you continue your work in her life and in the lives and bodies of Many of this congregation suffering with chronic disease, with injuries and, and surgeries, we pray for your grace each day. We lift up especially today Junior Doima. We pray that you'll bless him as he goes to the Mayo Clinic on Tuesday, that, that you would guard and protect his mind and his heart. We lay his life and every day yet ordained for him before you. Heavenly Father, we continue to lift up Joanne Hoagland and Linda Klein and Faith Franken as they also 
live with this diagnosis of cancer. Heavenly Father, may you be to them in this day all that they need. We continue to lift up Ed Zorman as well as he goes through chemo. We pray that you would give him patience. Heavenly Father, that you would bless this treatment and if it's your will, remove cancer from his body. Pray for each of our family members walking this road of cancer with every disease as well. Continue to pray for Beth Kudem. We ask that you will watch over her, bring her a restoration of health. Heavenly Father, we pray for our families, that you would bless our marriages, that you would bless those who are single. That you would enable us, each of us, in whatever season of life, to live in a holy way before you, to find deep fellowship in your body. Heavenly Father, that you would bring reconciliation where we are in strained relationship with family members, with co-workers, with roommates. Heavenly Father, we pray for those who are walking this road of adoption. We are so thankful for this beautiful alternative to abortion, Lord, the way in which you, even as you have adapted us into your family, bring young children into our families. And we pray that you would bless each family walking this journey. Heavenly Father, we also pray for your peace for those who are grieving the loss of loved ones. We pray, especially this morning, for Marvin and Esther Van Dunselaar. We pray that as they grieve the loss of Pastor Van Dunselaar's mother, that you would surround them, that you would lift them up. Lift up also those who are in prison, Lord. We pray for the Cornerstone Prison Ministry and we ask that you would stir our hearts if you've called us to be a part of that, to, to come tomorrow, to be trained and to serve. We pray that you'd bless us, each of us in whatever ways you've called us to serve in this new week. Give us strength, give us joy as we see you going behind us and before us, above us, below us, and beside us. For We pray these things in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. This morning our offering is for first for the ministry of this church in all of its various aspects, and second for Christian education, which is again an outworking of our promise at baptism.
brothers and sisters, we began this service as God gathered us in, the lost and the broken, all too often compromised people living in a compromised world. Now, having heard the story of our salvation in Jesus, we go out from this place by grace alone, and that is our closing song, Grace Alone. We'll sing stanza stanza one, receive God's blessing, and then sing stanza two. Please stand as the music begins. Go forth in that grace, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each of you now and forevermore. Amen.